Thank you so much, yes. I, uh, I want to say that I uh, feel, oh, thank you, that's very kind. <laughs> Uh, I feel a little bit guilty because I'm like, wow, you've already heard more than enough from me today. Like if I were sitting there, I'd be like, I already heard from this lady. I don't really want to hear from her again. But I also appreciate that when we have visitors come to San Francisco State, I just had a colleague there two weeks ago. We work them as hard as possible so we get their money's worth. So I can empathize on that. So you, I want you to get your money's worth for my, my flight up here. Um, so uh, earlier we did a workshop and it was pretty squarely focused on issues of equity and diversity. All these things sort of interact. Uh, and for this sort of hour on a Friday night, I gotta say, I can't believe you're here. <laughs> on a Friday night, I'm telling you, I'm going back. I, I don't think we would ever get a room full of people on a Friday night at San Francisco State for a science education symposium. Uh, we're gonna be more squarely in the land of assessment or trying to measure how students sort of think about things. And it's much more uh, research talk from my lab. So I'm gonna give a research talk. There will be interactive components to that research talk. But I'm, uh, and I think it will be fun, but I'm not doing it because it's fun. I'm doing it because those interactive components of the talk over the years seem to help people make a memory, encode a strong memory, retrieve that memory, so that they pass me in an airport two years later and be like, oh my god, I started superheroes with you. And it had something to do with how people learn about biology, and then they grab it back. So raise your hand if you came because you thought superheroes were involved in what we were doing. Oh, come on, don't lie to me. All right, there you go. So, uh, so that's definitely coming your way. Um, so I'll just say very briefly that I'm a neurobiologist by training. It's a really important part of who I am. Earlier I emphasized that I'm first generation college going, which is also an important part of who I am. Uh, and so these are just recordings from my graduate work, all published in kind of neurobiological journals. And I put this up because I'm not going to talk in terms of neurons and synapses and neural networks, but everything about the particular piece of research that I'm going to share with you is informed by sort of my own framework of thinking about neural circuits in the brain, which is just a different way of thinking about it. Um, and so uh, I won't use those words, but that's in the back of my mind. Uh, and I'll say that it's only one sort of piece of a lot of work that's done by tons of people in the CEPA lab. So we have uh, four postdocs and five grad students and a fabulous staff um, doing lots of research, coursework to help our fellow scientists be the best ambassadors of science they can be, uh, programs, and just like any other research lab, we're funded by the usual suspects, the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, so I'm very gracious to all those folks, and what I'll show you today is really specifically funded by a National Science Foundation Career Award, which is a lovely, a, a lovely opportunity I've had in my career. Um, so ideas that drive the research we do that won't necessarily come up in this project, but are the backdrop, so I want to emphasize them, are that um, twice as many undergrads leave the sciences as the humanities in the U.S. Now that's kind of an old number. It comes from uh, this study, but other studies talking about leaving why undergrads leave the sciences by Elaine Seymour and Nancy Hewitt, who's no longer with us. And in you know education research, sometimes things get published more as books as opposed to journal articles or papers. Uh, and this one, it's got an iceberg on the front. It's supposed to be sort of the tip of the iceberg, the problems, the challenges that we have. And it was one of the first studies that showed the people who are leaving the sciences are as talented as the people who stay. They're statistically indistinguishable in terms of GPAs or SAT scores. So we're losing people from a discipline I love. Everything that I do is because I love biology, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, the other thing which we've talked about uh, earlier, many people have um, alluded to this today, women and scientists of color continue to be underrepresented in the sciences. So we're not at a place where we could predict uh, it would be random who leaves. You can predict who leaves based on personal characteristics. Few scientists have formal training in how to teach. So raise your hand if you're a scientist and you were drop kicked into a classroom with no background in how to teach. Yes. Yeah, so I'm known across the country for being a real advocate for my fellow scientist colleagues because it's an, a very unfair system that we have. Uh, and it's changing, but it's changing remarkably slowly. Um, and then related to the talk specifically today, that research in biology education tends to lag behind other science disciplines. So depending on how you count, physics education research has like a 30 to 40 year history. Chemistry education, no, a little bit shorter time. And then biology, some people would say I'm in the first big generation of biology education researchers, but there are certainly some people doing it uh, in generations before me. And then the project that I want to highlight today is, relates to this, uh, this statement, which doesn't need a question mark, I need to change that. There's a dearth of research on how students' ideas are changing or not changing about biology during their undergraduate education. 
So people come in, they take a lot of courses, they graduate, they get the big hat, but we don't necessarily have a lot of evidence about how their ideas have changed or not changed in biology. Um, there's research that I'm known for that I'm not going to talk about today, and I'm just going to flash two things up. So I actually found out a lot about uh, Washington, Western Washington University because of research I do on this phenomenon of science faculty with education specialties. It's what I call the navel gazing research <laughs> I do. I never planned on studying, like, why are science departments hiring education researchers? But uh, myself and two chemists and a couple of other biology colleagues got sort of tasked with doing that kind of research many years ago. I'll just say that if you're a young person who's interested in going into education research in the sciences and science departments, more people have been hired into positions like mine in the last decade than the history of the higher dates. So it's a very uh, fabulous career pathway that's sort of emerged more recently. Um, and then the other piece of research that I do that I sometimes uh, talk about, but I sort of chose something different this time, is I collaborate with a, a uh, of people in a variety of disciplines. That's probably the most important thing that I feel like I've accidentally done in my career. Uh, and John Coley's at Northeastern and I have done a lot of, uh, increasingly done research on trying to investigate common origins of diverse misconceptions, sort of scientifically inaccurate ways of thinking that persist uh, in the college level. And if you wanted to read more about that, there are a couple of um, papers that we've published. So some people know me for that work. Um, but what I want to talk about today is relates to this problem of measuring how students develop expertise in a discipline, and I'll try and briefly unpack what I mean by that. So I want to introduce that problem. I want us to have a common experience using card sorting. Raise your hand if you've ever done card sorting of any, any sort. So several people have done card sorting. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever done a biology card sorting task. Biology. Oh, there we go. Okay. I need to learn more about that. Um, I'll tell you a brief piece of history, and then I'll show you some data, and we'll make some predictions about what you think that data is going to look like. Uh, I will say right up front, the goal of this talk is not to have everybody go do card sorting. <laughs> I don't use card sorting deeply in my teaching. I use it some. But this is very much a research talk, trying to develop a research tool that would measure something I happen to care about. You don't have to care about it, but I care about it. Uh, and it ends up being potentially very uh, uh, attractive tool for program-level assessment, assessment for like your entire degree program, like people measuring what they think when they come in and then when they leave. So uh, raise your hand if you've ever heard of vision and change in undergraduate biology education. Ah, see, yeah, and this is why I came to Western Washington. I usually ask that question, zero. No one raises their hand. I give a lot of research seminars in biology departments. People, that the penetrance of this is uh, remarkably low. So one of the many things this document, uh, sorry, it's depressing to me. Uh, one of the many things that this document aspires to address is what do we expect undergraduates to be able to do, not know, but to be able to do as a result of their undergraduate biology education. Uh, and I just want to give you one quote that's sort of a flavor of the document, and it actually rationalizes very much what the, the research I'm going to tell you about is about. It says, biology in the 21st century requires that undergraduates learn how to integrate concepts across levels of organization and complexity. Okay, integrate concepts across levels of organization and complexity, that's one piece. And to synthesize and analyze information that connects conceptual domains. Okay, so connecting, synthesizing across conceptual domains. You don't see like the Krebs cycle listed, <laughs> right? Or structure of nucleotides or anything. So it's a very lofty kind of goal uh, that runs throughout this document. And I'm going to shorthand it for now in, uh, as thinking conceptually like a biologist. And one of our colleagues who was doing a breakout group was talking about, oh, I want to figure out how they think like a scientist. And this is a little bit different. It's very much conceptually like a biologist. So here's a kind of an example. If you went up to somebody and you said, hey, what do you think about, what kind of words come to mind when I say antibiotic resistance? Well, if that was a person who's a lay person, I would expect them to say, Walgreens, doctor, finish the course of antibiotics. I don't know, some things like that. Totally fine. But if I walked up to a, a, a biologist or someone who's a biology student or somebody who saw the world through a biology lens, then I would expect them to say natural selection, evolution, genetic variation, mutation, um, and probably a whole host of other things. So that's a little bit like, a little bit the kind of an example of what we mean. Like, you don't have to become a biologist to be able to see macroscopic real world problems through the lens of biology. So, in my lab many years ago, uh, we were like, well, that's great, but how would we measure that? <laughs> so 
So these are fabulous aspirations. I've always been a big fan of measurement. Uh, how would we measure that? So we did what everybody does that's trying to get started on a project. Well, to what extent do the current measurement approaches that we know about actually get us some kind of insight into this thinking like a biologist? It's hard to get your hands around. Uh, so exams and quizzes. So if you're a faculty member, if you've taught, you know that sometimes those get written at 2 in the morning. You know that they're written so that students do well. <laughs> or to, you hope they do well, they're written to fit into certain time frames. So we like to think exams and quizzes measure something about um, people's understanding, but they're fraught with all sorts of problems, and, and most people realize that. There are more formalized things that look a lot like exams and quizzes called concept inventories, which uh, are generally multiple choice tests, you could think of them as that, where there's a, a question, there are usually f like five options, one that's scientifically accurate, and then four other distractors, but that are based on some kind of known misconception in the literature. So they're supposed to be diagnostic in that sense. Uh, the first ones are developed in physics. And the uh, NSF was funding no less than like 25 different biology education research groups to put together concept inventory. So there's a lot of push to have this um, be a diagnostic tool, a measurement tool. I'm personally not convinced that picking one idea out of a group of five is going to provide me, personally, evidence that someone's thinking conceptually like a biologist. And we've had some studies in the lab that show that those kind of performance on multiple choice tests vastly overestimate how well someone would score in their written response to that same question. So uh, Julia Smith, who is a co-architect of much of what I'm going to tell you about, did a sabbatical in my lab. And the way we started, she said, I think I want to build a concept inventory. And then we had a lot of conversations. We wrote a lot of papers. And she's like, I think I don't want to build a concept inventory. <laughs> And then we ended up working on this card sorting task. Um, so it's unclear if these kinds of tools measure this thinking like a biologist, making connections, connecting across domains and levels of organization. So we've tried a lot of things, open-ended written assessments. That's like an essay that you could code. Uh, videotaped interviews are fabulously revealing, like talking to someone and seeing what they say. Um, and it was doing videotaped interviews that we realized it doesn't really matter which of these we use. We're still measuring like a piece of information, uh, a piece of knowledge. You have to like ask about something. And when you ask about something, you're all of a sudden not, you're not assessing connection. So uh, an insight came from analyzing interview data. Uh, Brianna McCarthy was in my lab. She's now a tenured professor at um, Las Positas Community College. She's a biology faculty member. Um, and she was doing interviews that had to do with climate change. So she would give people this prompt, the greenhouse effect can be made smaller by planting trees. So you could probably puzzle over that for the next 10 minutes, maybe you will. But we were trying to see, well, to what, what kinds of information would students bring up? We were trying to understand how, what they were thinking about carbon and uh, energy and matter transformations. And so they would bring up climate change, because you know greenhouse effect was there. They would bring up photosynthesis, which relates to planting trees. Sometimes they would bring up respiration, carbon cycle. But when they would bring it up, it was often very fragmented, and it was fraught with lots of misconceptions. And we did the same thing talking to faculty who brought up these things. But what experts seemed to be doing that the, the, under, the undergrads did not seem to be doing was making this connection. They didn't connect that plants did photosynthesis. They didn't connect that, well, that part of that was taking carbon dioxide gas out of the atmosphere, and that carbon dioxide gas is a greenhouse effect, is a greenhouse gas, and that that related to climate change. So is that sort of connection of ideas that just never seem to be present, in addition to there being lots of misconceptions? So we said, hmm, the insight we had, I'm not going to talk about this project, but the insight we had is, huh, perhaps what we need to be measuring are the connections, not the pieces. Uh, and I kind of hit myself over the head, because I'm a neurobiologist, and I was like, ah, it's exactly like what we do in neurobiology. Like, we don't, like, I mean, we do measure things about individual neurons. But what's interesting is the connections between those neurons, the strengths of the connections between those neurons, uh, not the individual neurons themselves. So, so maybe we can move from looking at individual pieces of knowledge to design something that would measure how people were connecting things together. There are a variety of ways we could have gone about this, but uh, I started reading and talking to lots of folks. And cognitive psychology. Um, studies this all the time, that's what's great. Uh, and they, I'm going to shorthand it, expertise. Well, there's some nuances to that. But expertise in cognitive psychology is in part thinking about how an expert structures their knowledge. So they have more pieces of knowledge than a novice, but what seems to be very interesting is how they put that together or how they structure it. Um, and expertise is studied in chess, 
You can have chess experts. You can have uh, expertise in uh, reading radiograms. There are all sorts of ways that you can study someone's expertise in a discipline. So we said, OK, cognitive psychology, they got some stuff that we should pay attention to. So how might we, in biology, probe some sort of emerging expertise, the structure of the biology knowledge, the connections between the pieces uh, among biology majors? And we thought, hmm, well, let's take some of the tasks, some of the research methods from cognitive psychology, which include card sorting tasks, and see if we can develop some kind of task where we could distinguish novices and experts. And I will say it's really important when you're talking to people about developing expertise, like who do they consider a novice and who do they consider an expert? Who do they use? And so in this study, novices we used as non-biology majors. It could have been kindergartners, but they require more snacks and they have to go to the bathroom a lot and <laughs> the language can be challenging. So we chose college level novices. Uh, and similarly, also a group that requires a lot of snacks. <laughs> it's good to have a lot. I've never said that before in this talk, but it struck me as relevant. Uh, experts, so we chose biology faculty. And I take no end of criticism from most psychologists about that because they say that is a really bad idea for a group of experts because biology faculty are not normal. You should get like a broader array of biologists, including like doctors and biotech people and things like that. So for right now, I'm sticking by my clan. Our experts are biology faculty. All right, so then you can see really quickly, and we're almost to a card sort, that if you had a task that could distinguish these folks, then you can start to ask some questions that make people nervous. You can start to ask, what, is the, what, what in a card sorting task do entering biology majors look like? Do they look like non-majors? Do they look at all different? To what extent do graduating biology majors look different than entering biology majors on this task? And to what extent do they look any more like, oops, sorry, any more like experts? And this is the point where oftentimes in a room, people start, the biology faculty start shifting around in their chairs, like, oh no, this makes me really nervous. And it shouldn't make you nervous, because we're all just trying to get smarter about what students are learning from us and how we can do that better. We're just all trying to get smarter about that. Okay, so that's kind of the overview. So what I want to do is to have a common experience with a card sorting task. And I want to do that because there's uh, the language of cognitive psychology is just a different language that most people are used to using. And I think this will help you get your head around it without doing something that's too far out of your comfort zone. So uh, our common experience with card sorting, this is where the superheroes come in, uh, is going to be with superheroes. And I'm also going to have you do it with a partner because, frankly, it's 520 on a Friday. <laughs> I don't really want a room full of people quietly sorting superhero cards. So this is not how we do it in research. People would do it alone. Because here I'm going to ask you to sort of negotiate with someone else about how to organize something. And you might disagree with your partner that you know, might bring different things. So you don't have to land on one sort if you don't want to. Um, and your instruction is, there are nine cards. I want you to group them based on whatever you consider to be a fundamental organization of superheroes. <laughs> Now, I will say, I gave this talk in Argentina about a month ago, and a very, very famous Italian linguist said, Kimberly, I do not want to play your game. <laughs> so, if you don't know anything about superheroes, it's fine. It's okay. You're going to be fine. All right? I promise you, everyone can do this task. And I, I think it's going to help you understand the data, because I want you to understand the data. All right? The only guidelines, and these are for faculty, students, no, no, don't pass anything out. Mm -mm, no, 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 no. Put it all back. I was trained by a very outstanding middle school teacher. You're not going to hear anything I say if you have something in your hands. OK. And this is important. And these are faculty back here, too. See, this is why I need to I'll stand back here. So the only guidelines are that each card must belong to only one group. No fence sitting. OK, you can't like say, oh, it's kind of both. So pick one. The second is your team must have at least two and less than nine groups. Well, that sounds like I'm about to sue you in a lawsuit, right? But that, that's because faculty say, oh, but Kimberly, they're all superheroes. I'm done. They're all in one group. Or they say, oh, Kimberly, they're all so unique. They deserve their own group. So uh, that's not going to help me understand the structure of your knowledge of superheroes. So please don't do that. And once you form the groups, if you have time, come up with a name for your groups. You know, like why did you put them together? Uh, and I'm going to hear out from maybe two or, two or three groups. Uh, to try and be able to layer some language on. So now, you're very helpful, I appreciate it. Grab the people on the ends of the rows, and you guys might have to walk. There, one envelope for every two people. One envelope for two people. Happy sorting! Only about five minutes, five minutes. You need some? Find a buddy, don't sort alone, don't sort alone. Awesome, thank you very much.
Oh, there you go. Can we do you can. People? Yeah, you can. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. No worries. Can you see all right? Okay. Scott, can you see okay? Yes. Okay. No worries. Andrew can be your hands. You all right? Oh, we're having a great time. That's awesome. Are you getting in there, Steve? I'm, I'm okay. Uh, Say it again. Do these all come from? Uh, you didn't make any of these up. No, no, they're all real. Well, real. Well, they're all uh, published. <laughs> they're all published. Are you guys okay? Yeah. Okay, very animated, so good. <laughs> All right. Something? All right. Tell me, what are your, what are your groups? Okay, we've got... We've got animals, robot-looking things. Very nice. Oh, that's lovely. You're going to report out, I hope? All right, that's awesome. Okay. All right, let me get your attention. Good luck with that, Kimberly. All right. How are you doing? Back row, you're good, yeah? All right, okay. I tried to snoop. I think most people are to some kind of grouping. Are you there, no? Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, so maybe if I can just have, in the spirit of time, if I could maybe three groups to share. Uh, uh, what groups did you make? Uh, and then just kind of how did you label them? And I'll try and sort of point as we go. Um, and please say the names of the people you sorted with, right? Because you're a team. All right, so three hands. All right, we have here, we have here, boom, boom. Well, maybe we have four groups, so I might sort of go with that. Um, okay, I'm going to start in the back and I'm going to come forward. Deal? Please say your names and what were your groups? Alina, this is John. Uh, we have three groups. Three groups. Okay, now I just realized, thank you so much. So I'm going to hear your other two groups, but I just realized I forgot something very important. <laughs> okay, stick with me. I know you got materials in front of you, and it's chaos. This is not a competition. <laughs> so did you hear what just happened? She's like, okay, we have a group and it has animals. Yeah! <laughs> All right, so that was my fault. It's not a competition. So, you know, I'll, I'll ask you to raise your hand if you had a similar group, but. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to sort. I'm, I cannot say this enough. There's no right or wrong way to sort. I don't think these folks believe me. There's no right or wrong way to sort. But there are different ways to sort, and that's what we're interested in. So the difference, the diversity of sorting is good. So raise your hand if you did have an animal kind of superhero category. Look around the room. I'm sorry, you're up front. You can kind of look around. It might make you dizzy. You don't have to turn around. All right, so there are a bunch of people who had that. Okay, uh, Lena and John, what was your next group? Things that look like robots. We had cyborg and warlock. Cyborg and warlock. All right. Uh, and then we had one that was names that mean thunderstorm. <laughs> names that mean thunderstorm. So it was Thor and Storm. Thor and Storm. Thor, Thor and Storm. And Storm. Where was Superman in your sort? Under things that have animals. 
Animal. Oh, man. Man counts as animal. Totally fair. Okay. All right. Raise your hand if you had a robot type category, even if it was a different group. Okay. It's a bunch. Raise your hand if you had things that sounded like thunderstorm. Okay. There you go. All right. So. All right. Appreciate it. Okay. Next group. We got to sort of fly along here. Who is my next group? Oh, there you go. What were your names? Okay, kind of over here. Classic. Okay. And the category is we don't know. Them. Yep. <laughs> totally fair. Cyborg and Warlock. Cyborg and Warlock, we don't know them. And then the more recent developments of X-Men and Wolverine and Storm. Most more recent developments of X-Men, Wolverine and Storm. Okay, raise your hand if you had an X-Men category. Okay, so a couple groups. Uh, people we don't know category. All right, nicely done. Very important part of science is saying I have no idea. And then classic category, that one's, yeah, okay, so that's from a, kind of a new one. All right, thank you so much. Right here. Um, I'm Leslie, this is Georgianne. Leslie and Georgianne. And we had a, a, an animal category. Okay. That was Wolverine, a non-man, except that we had your, yeah. Uh, oh, Wolverine, Ant-Man, and Batman. Wolverine, Ant-Man, and Batman, right on here, okay. Ones that were standing up. <laughs> All right. Uh, Iron Man, Cyborg, and Warlock. Okay. Ones that kind of looked like they were flying. Uh -huh. Thor, Superman, and Storm. Okay. Super. Raise your hand if you had a flying category. <laughs> All right. Yeah, flying right down front. Right down front. Okay. And we did. Uh, we did. We did uh, each of these. We've had like. What did you call these? Okay. Standing up. Okay. It overlaps with the robot category. So you can see already, people can put cards together, and that gives you one set of information. And then how they title them gives you a different set of information. I'm not going to show you a lot of data from the titling, but it turns out to be very important in some other projects. OK, and then you've been very patient. Thank you. Well, uh, we had three categories. What were your names? My, my good pal, uh, friend is called Paul, and I'm Ben. Paul and Ben, thank um, you. Okay, who are those? Wolverine, Ant-Man, and Iron Man. Wolverine, uh, sorry, Wolverine, Ant-Man, and, Ant and Iron Man. Batman. Uh, and then we have, Batman. like, alien weirdos or superhuman uh, extraterrestrials, Thor and uh, Superman. Thor and Superman. And then, uh, like, uh, some sort of mutants and or technological beings, cyborg, warlock, and storm. Cyborg, Warlock, and Sporn, some kind of mutants or technological beings. Okay. Raise your hand if you had an alien category. That's a new one we haven't quite heard. Okay, a couple there. And then I'm going to sort of pass on those because we had different versions of that. Okay, thank you. Did anybody have sorts that were different than those you've heard in some kind of radical way? Okay, and I, yeah, I have a suspicion about what's going on. Okay, the group in the back. What were your names? Uh, Trent and Mark. Trent and Mark. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and what's Marvel? Wait, which ones are Marvel? Okay, so we guessed that for Marvel, it was Ant-Man, Thor, Iron Man, Storm, and we didn't see any robots. No worries, no, you don't have to apologize about this. Just Marvel, Cyborg, and Warlock, and then for right. DC, uh, the ones I knew off the top of my head are Aquaman, Wonder Woman, uh, Batman, and Superman. Batman and Superman would be DC, and then all the other ones, these other seven, would be Marvel. Okay. Uh, any other burning, other kinds of sorts that people did? Yes. We had a similar sort. We tried to do that and then realized we couldn't do it and we don't tell it. <laughs> uh, but we did something similar. We did the, the group of Paul and Ben. We had regular humans with crazy suits. So we had Iron Man, Ant Man, and Batman. Oh, Iron Man, Ant Man, and Batman. With gear. Yeah. Uh, then we got the mutants, Wolverine, and Storm. Mutants. We don't really know what these are. All right. So some overlap, with, especially with mutants. And then I'm, I'm going to drop the W word, but <laughs> the aliens right there. And then sometimes this gets called uh, rich, rich guys with technology, kind of these, some, some of them. Um, OK, so uh, thank you very much. So I want to try and layer on some language that will help us 
look at the data and help you uh, hopefully be able to make some predictions about the data I'm going to show. So one of the first things that happened uh, in looking at card sorts was uh, we did something that I didn't think was really that striking, which is we made a hypothesis. And um, I'm sure that uh, cognitive psychologists had some hypotheses, but we actually constructed our stimulus set based on a hypothesis, which has some weaknesses and it has some strengths. And I did the same thing here for you. So we had very specific hypotheses about how we thought people who were superhero novices might sort. Remember, being a superhero novice is not a bad thing. I'm a superhero novice. I've given this talk literally hundreds of times. And unless I really think about it, I have a very hard time sorting in an expert framework. So exposure does not mean that you learn it. Uh, and the hypothesis was this. We thought folks who didn't necessarily have a lot of experience or pieces to connect, remember we're trying to study connections, would go based on what the cards look like. So they would put robot type, maybe flying type, maybe animal type. Okay, so that was our hypothesis about superhero novice sorting. And in the literature, this is, this is not something I made up, but it's this, this sort of sorting based on a, something you can see in these cards, it's physical appearance, are what we are calling hypothesized surface features, okay? Surface is not pejorative, it's not good nor bad, it's just surface, you can get it from looking at the cards. Um, and what I want to say is that novices, in, in all the data that I've ever looked at from a lot of fields, novices sort in a lot of different ways. Like, there's a lot of divergence. There's not a talk I give where somebody doesn't come up with a new way to do it. Um, since movies have been coming out, so some people are like, these are ones that have had movies, these are ones that have not had movies. There's all sorts of ways you can sort them. Now, I just want to pause for a moment and ask, what does it feel like to be a novice? So if you're a student, you might be like, oh, Kimberly, I feel like this all the time. But for faculty, it's oftentimes a very long time since you felt like a novice at something. Like, wherever you are, you're an expert. You put yourself in expert places. What does it feel like to have me up here labeling you a novice? I like my flying type category, right? Uh, or just to organize ideas differently than your instructor. So I think this idea of trying to understand the perspective of novices is really important. Um, I talked <laughs> early, earlier today about my dad. One of the, my dad did take a college chemistry course. So I'm first generation college going for more than a course. <laughs> and uh, he was told, forget everything you learned in high school chemistry. That was bullshit. You're going to learn real chemistry now. Pardon my language, but that was what was said to him. All right, and that's kind of a way of saying, wow, you don't know anything about this, even though you've chosen to come to my discipline and learn from me. And so that's not a very welcome belonging kind of message. So I've ended up thinking a lot more about what students feel like in my classroom when I'm presenting kind of things that I know really well that they've maybe never heard of or might be in conflict with what they're thinking. So that's just a brief aside. So we also had uh, ex um, hypotheses about how we thought superhero experts would sort. And those hypotheses were based on the fact that they were going to know a lot more pieces of information that they could connect that weren't on the cards. So they might say, oh, Iron Man, Thor, and Ant-Man are the Avengers. They have shared histories. They have shared battles. Yes, exactly. Trin knows this. Uh, Justice League, if you grew up in the 70s like me, I actually did watch this on cartoons. Oh, yes, yes. Cyborg, maybe less well known, but Superman and Batman, members of the Justice League. And then the X-Men, which have had quite the renaissance. Uh, Storm and Wolverine in particular, Warlock a little bit less known, member of the X-Men. I don't know him well. Don't ask me much about him. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, X-Men. So that was what we hypothesized. That would be sorting, and this is a language of, of uh, literature, based on deep features, okay? Not good nor bad, but deep features that aren't on the cards. Now, the cool thing about card sorting, keep in mind, surface features, deep features. It's what you need right now. Then the third thing that's really cool about card sorting that I didn't appreciate even when we started is that card sorting allows you to reveal unhypothesized frameworks, okay? So I actually went when I was developing this task, which was solely because I had to give this talk to a chemistry group of chemistry faculty after dinner in the summer, and I thought, there's no way I'm going to have them sort biology cards. So I came up with this, which has proven to be helpful. And I took it to Frank, who runs a local comic book store, where my family members, Ivy, Jasper, and Henry, spend an enormous amount of my salary. And I said, <laughs> Frank, I said, Frank, how would you sort these cards? And he said, oh, well, that's really easy. I would sort them into Marvel and DC. Now, we never hypothesized that, but that's what we would call uh, an emergent framework. You can detect unhypothesized ways people are organizing their knowledge that you didn't even necessarily come up with if you sort of ask questions and have them sort of share their rationales and group names and things like that. 
So I probably won't have time to, I'm not going to present data on this, but if you have questions, I can tell you about the unhypothesized frameworks that are emerging for biology students. Um, and then, so the last thing I'll sort of say from a teaching piece, because if you're like, Kimberly, I'm never going to do this for research, from a teaching piece, I've started to think a lot more about the extent to which I let students in on my expert framework in my classroom. And experts uh, are notoriously poor at even realizing what their frameworks are. Um, but we've certainly started to become more, I've started to become a lot more explicit about why I put certain things together, why this all goes into an evolution bucket, right, as opposed to just presenting lots of evolution ideas and never trying to help people connect that in my classroom. All right, so at this point, all I want you to hopefully buy, and you don't have to buy it, but this is what I'm hoping you'll buy, is that the structure of an individual's card sort may reflect something about those connections, how they put pieces of knowledge together, uh, and that might have something to do with developing expertise. All right, so I want to show you data. Time's a flying. Uh, and I just want to give hats off to Mickey Chi. So um, she was the person who, in physics back in the 80s, published a paper called Categorization and Representation of Physics Problems by Experts and Novices. It was very inspirational to all the work that we're doing today. We made about four or five key sort of shifts that, um, so we had a specific hypothesis that structured our stimulus set, and we did some other things that made us be able to crank quantitative metrics out of uh, our studies. But I want to say that it was all very much inspired by some early work that Dr. Chi did. Um, so to our task. So we said, OK, let's come up with a card sorting task and see if we can distinguish novices and experts in our field. So we hypothesized that the way novices might organize biology, the surface features, OK, kind of like flying type, animal type, would be organism type. And even when I talk to scientists, I'm like, oh, what do you study? They say, I study plants, <laughs> right? So we tend to re revert to organism type. And then our hypothesized deep features were what we call these fundamental biological principles, um, evolution and natural selection, I've already alluded to, pathways of transformation and energy that has to do with carbon cycling and photosynthesis and respiration, relationships between structure and function, which could be between the structure of a gene or a structure of a protein and that protein function. It could be at the level of an organ, structure function for an organ. And then storage and passage of information in living systems, which most people would think of as genetics, meiosis, mitosis. How do you get information from one cell to the next, one organism to the next? Um, <laughs> when, I, when I asked my, when I were doing this and I asked my spouse, who's also a neurobiologist, I was like, what are the fundamental biological principles? And he said, is there more than one? And he's like the nicest person in the universe. So he was being very serious. And he said, I thought there was only one evolution and natural selection. And that actually comes up later in some of the data. OK, so I didn't put the actual uh, card text here, but we have a card set that's a four by four. You were sorting superheroes. It was a three by three set. Uh, and for each one of those cards, it has a surface feature. So card D is a card about plants, but that's also about pathways of transformation, energy, and matter. So here's a sample card. And I apologize, it's a little blurry. A glucose-fed yeast cell is moved from an aerobic an oxygenated environment to an anaerobic one without oxygen. For the cell to continue generating ATP at the same rate, how would the rate of glucose consumption in this microorganism need to change? And importantly, we tell students, don't try and solve the problem. Just try and figure out what are the fundamental biological principles behind that problem. So turn and talk to a neighbor for just 10 seconds. What, is your, what do you hypothesize the surface feature, the organism type is, and what might the deep feature of this be? If you don't remember them, see if you can remember them with your buddy. Really quick, 10 seconds. Oh, Todd, no, oh, good. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to do this as a as a choral response. You're so excited. I'm going to do this as a choral response, choral like a chorus, like you're all going to shout at me. And I do this sometimes in my 300 person class to check things when I don't want to take time to do a clicker question. So if you were going to shout out what the surface feature of this card might be, shout it as loud as you can at me. OK, there you go. Okay. So I heard microorganisms, which if you go back to ours, yeah, microorganisms, right? Sorry, I should have written a cheat sheet up there. So I call it microorganism. All right, and then shout something about the deep feature at me. <laughs> All right, a little less clear that time. So 
Shout it at me now. Which one of these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. Pathways of energy and matter, something like that. I heard a lot of energy, I heard a lot of matter. So I, t I totally agree with that. So that's, how, that's just what a card looks like. Most of them are taken, they're sort of adapted from the back of textbooks. We didn't make them up. And we try and take out as much jargon as we can so that the non-majors don't think like, oh, I can't do anything with this. All right, so the research design is, much like you did the superhero sort, we start with what's called unframed. That's what Mickey cheated in her study. And we give people a set of cards, just like I gave you. We say sort them into, you know, not just one and not 16 groups, and name them. And then we ask them some reflection questions like, why did you sort this way? Uh, then something else that we did that was very different than the cheese study, which has turned out to be incredibly useful, is Julie and I were like, I'm not sure that the faculty will all sort the same way. <laughs> so why don't we have a second stage where we give them the names of the deep features, and then we think the faculty will line up. And so we have a second sort where we give people the cards again, usually the same, same day, and say, hey, here are four categories, evolution, information flow, energy and matter, structure function. So could you sort the cards into these categories? If somebody asked you to do it, how would you do it? Uh, and then have some reflection questions. And we did it this way so that we could conduct it in classes and write uh, classes with sort of large end values. So Mickey Chi's study was an interview study. They had like eight novices and eight experts. We wanted to be able to try and look at larger numbers of people. So uh, Julia Smith did a sabbatical in my lab and was absolutely critical in developing the stimulus set. And Elijah Combs and Paul Nagami, who are both now uh, biology teachers, one's a community college faculty and one's a high school biology teacher, uh, were grad students in the lab who did an enormous amount of work helping to figure out the quantitative metrics uh, that we use to make sense of this. So I want to show you raw data. This is what an unframed sort looks like. This is a biology faculty member. You, there's no reason you would know this, but this is a perfect hypothesized energy and matter set of cards, ADLF. CHNK is a perfect hypothesized evolution group. BEJO is a perfect hypothesized information flow group, and GIMP is a perfect hypothesized structure function group. You can see that their titles are a little different than evolution or than energy and matter or information flow or structure function. So we have a rubric to try and score, like, well, do we count that? And for example, these would all count as sort of in sort of an expert like group name. Uh, so we saw that and we were sort of surprised. Not every faculty member does this, and not in frame sort, but you see it. Uh, and then we looked at non-biology majors, and this might be a little bit small for people in the back. So this is microorganism, insects, plant, and humans. And this is a perfect hypothesized novice sort. And when I showed this to faculty colleagues, they said, no way, no way would anybody, if you told them to sort on fundamental biological principles, do it according to organism type, Kimberly. No way. So also, you don't see this tons of the time, but you see it. Um, so that's kind of what the data looks like raw, and for a lot of the card sorting literature, not all of it, but for a lot of it, this is kind of where people stay, is in the qualitative realm. Yes? Quick yeah. Yes. Yes. That is the instruction we say like three or four times and it's written on a piece of paper. Yeah. Doesn't mean they, they follow that to the best of their ability is the way I think about it. And in interviews, they seem to follow that to the best of their ability. Um, so we asked ourselves, okay, well, how could we quantify this? Um, and we did a bunch of different quantifications. I'm only show you one example because I want you to make some predictions about some data. But the one that I'm going to show you is we did quantitative analysis of percent of card pairs that are hypothesized deep versus surface. So that's a lot of language. So what does that mean? So this sort is 100% surface feature pairs. So I can look at this group and I can say, oh, this person made an AC pair, an AE pair, an AG pair, a CE pair, a CG pair, and an EG pair. Right? So you can kind of say how many different kinds of pairs, and you generate them. And then you can divide by the total number of pairs they made, because if you make bigger groups, you'll have more pairs. And if you get lost there, don't worry, because it took us a long time to figure it out. But you come up with a percent of pairs that are surface feature. This is 100% surface feature pairs. We predicted that it would put, be put together based on service features. And the faculty one is 100% deep feature pairs. And then if people don't sort in those specific ways, and there's all sorts of um, percent pairings in between. Uh, and what you might also anticipate is that there are unexpected pairs. There are pairs of cards we didn't predict would be surface or deep. That's actually the majority of the pairs you can make. And so you'll be seeing percentages of unexpected pairs as well. So let me show you one piece of data, and then I'm going to have you make some predictions on a couple more pieces. So here is the first finding. This is the unframed condition. 
On the right is biology faculty. There are 23 of them, non-biology majors, about 100 of them. And then let's just stick black bars are the per average percent deep feature pairs produced. So this is percentage on Y. So that means biology faculty, of all of their pairs, about 80% of them were predicted deep features. Okay? If they'd all made perfect hypothesized expert sorts, that would be 100%. So it's not, but it's 80%. They made some surface feature pairs in white, and then they made some unexpected pairs in this kind of gray. And when you look at non-biology majors, they don't make all surface feature pairs. They just don't. So our hypothesis that they were going to sort based on surface features doesn't really pan out. So they make some surface feature pairs, they make some deep feature pairs, and they make some unexpected pairs. So, uh, so immediately, and I didn't put all the statistics up because there are all sorts of things you can compare, but these are statistically, indistingu uh, statistically distinguishable at the level of sort of the deep feature, certainly. So what I want you to do is to think about that for a minute and then think of this question. What if I gave the four deep feature group names, evolution, structure function, information flow, energy matter, to these non-biology majors, would they shift to look more like biology faculty? Talk to your neighbor. Ten seconds. What do you predict? <laughs> Sorry, this is boring because you you've already seen all this. I know. The new stuff's coming. The new stuff's coming in the next ten minutes. Sorry. And I will say, if you ever want to borrow superheroes, I give that away to people all the time, because it is a handy way to get people into it pretty quick. So. All right. So what do you think? So shout at me, yes, they're going to look more like faculty, or no, they're not going to look like faculty. Yes. Yes. Oh, you're such an optimist. It's the Washington State optimism. All right. So here's the data. The top is just a repeat of what I just showed you. And here is the bottom. Oops, here is the bottom. So I would, I would disagree. Uh, th the way we talk about this sort, oh, talk to a buddy 10 seconds because you're not going to listen to me. What do you notice about that graph? unpublished data that I want to show you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assert that we call this the, oh, damn, surface features don't work anymore. Like, organism type is not going to work when you give them those four group names. And so you get a shift. You get a few more deep feature pairs. You get equal number of unexpected pairs. So we conclude from this, this data and from their rationales and from a lot of other metrics I'm not showing you, uh, even if you give the expert framework to non-biology majors, they can't use it. OK? Which is interesting. I will say that the core concepts, the fundamental biological principles, are in K through 12. So we've got, I don't usually say this, but we've got a lot of K through 12 people in here. At some level, you could view this as a post-assessment for our high school biology. Right? I never say that out loud, but that's how, I mean, I came from the land of K through 12, and I learned everything important I know about teaching from K through 12 teachers. I have enormous respect for the K through 12 system. But this would say what we're teaching them, maybe it doesn't help them be able to use this framework. OK? All right. So. The task distinguishes putative, I would say putative now, putative novices and putative experts on multiple metrics. And I could go through bunches of them. This is the, there are people who study card sorting and they might be really interested in them, but most of you, you should not care. So if you want to read more, it was published in Life Sciences Education. Uh, I think the idea is not that everybody should go do biology card sorting, but that it's, I care about this connection business. Uh, I care about not the pieces of knowledge, but people being able to see those connections. And so for me, this starts to become a tool that might get at what I happen to care about. It's not perfect, but it's different than a concept inventory or a lot of the assessment tools that we have. Um, so there are some people out developing uh, genetics card sorts and evolution card sorts. Uh, the, there's a chemistry card sorting task that was developed right here that I had to talk with your colleagues about this morning. There's a chemistry card sort that just came out in Journal of Chemical Education from myself and some colleagues at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And we have a graduate student working on an interdisciplinary card sort to try and understand the extent to which students 
uh, connect ideas, for example, about energy and matter across physics, chemistry, and biology. So I, there's a lot of promise for being able to get some sense of how people are connecting ideas in pretty quick ways. So what I want to get to is this, to go back to the beginning of the talk in my last seven minutes, I swear I can do it. To what extent do biology majors organize their biology knowledge more like experts by the time they graduate? That was kind of the original question that I was really interested in. Peter Newberry from UC San Diego, who's now, I think, moving, moving north of here, drew this beautiful cartoon that I like to use. So entering biology majors, they come in, maybe they have some piece of information. They get so much more information, and maybe they start to structure it. And then look, they get the hat, and it's all structured. And maybe we assume that it's a lot like experts. So what data do we have to show that's the case? So I want to show you this graph. I'm just repeating. This is the unframed condition. I already showed you this data. This is the frame condition. I already showed you this data. I didn't say, but the framing sharpens the biology faculty a little bit. They still have some unexpected. You can ask me about that if you want. But this is just repeated data. So what I want you to do is we're going to make two predictions, and I'm going to show you two sets of data, and then it's going to be time to recept, to reception, go to the reception. So I want you to talk with a buddy, 30 seconds or so. What do you predict this is going to look like? Hang with me. For entering biology majors, advanced biology majors, and biology grad students. So this data was taken on the first day of lab and our very first biology course for majors. This data was taken in the last week of the last core course that all of our different flavors of biology majors take. These are a motley collection of master students who happen to come for pizza and did this for us. <laughs> so I just won't make any bones about that. Uh, and if, if it's too much, because if, if it were me, I'd be like, Kimberly, I can't follow this. Just predict what you think the black bars will look like. So the black bars for non-biology majors are here about 35%, and they're about 80% for biology faculty. OK, make some predictions. What's it going to look like really loud? 30 seconds to a minute. This should be new. This should be new. OK. All right. Do you want to see the data? Yes. yes that's exactly what uh, my students, when you do a clicker question, they're like, show us the graph. <laughs> I'm going to show it to you. And then you should keep talking. And then I want to hear from two people something you feel like you can conclude from the data. There it is. How are you doing? Very interesting. <laughs> John, you're very kind to me. <laughs> All right. You're like, I'm done with this. I'm almost there. We're almost there. OK. We got people who are like, Kimberly, I need a glass of wine. So two people, what's something that you observe about those bars? Anything you want to observe? I'm not fishing for an answer. Things that you observe. I see David. Wait, wait, wait. David. And then who else? David and Jennifer. All right, Jennifer. Uh, black bars are going up. The black bars are going up. <laughs> Somebody said, Kimberly, you can draw a line almost. No. And the novice ones, I guess, or whatever. The white ones, yeah, surface feature. And the service feature ones, if I took like a stick, you know, like a yard stick, you know, maybe it kind of looks like it's going down. Yes. Uh, David. Uh, yeah. And, the, the, and, and that the, the um, unexpected ones are pretty much the same thing. Very persistent. Very persistent. Yeah. Very persistent. Uh, other comment? Well, I'm, I'm curious about this persistence. Yeah. Is, is it misconceptions on this end and it's deeper, unpredictable associations? What, what's your name? Jude. You go, Jude. <laughs> yeah, so, the, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop into this because we probably won't have a lot of time for questions. So this is exactly what my spouse Henry predicted. So these are people collapsing evolution and information flow, usually, because you know evolution is based on genetic variation uh, inherited. So that most of these unexpecteds 
are kind of expected for experts. Over here, I would like to say that it's misconceptions, but we haven't really been able to find a very clear signal. The one misconception we see in here, which the K through 12 people might know, is that they put the yeast or fungus cards with plants, which is not a misconception I particularly care about or teach to, but that's the only one we kind of figure out. So it's not that clear. Um, OK, so we're going to do it for the frame condition. So the question, so I agree. It sort of looks like uh, when you look at these different populations, OK, these are different populations of people, that maybe with increasing biology education, you produce more deep features. And this is where my faculty are like, duh, Kimberly, we knew that. <laughs> uh, and so we'll get there. So now the frame condition, do you think giving the four deep feature categories of these populations will make any difference for them. So 30 seconds predict, and then we're almost done. 30 seconds predict. go like three minutes over but I'm almost done Are we okay you're gonna be like no okay <laughs> all right so once again I'm gonna show you the data in the spirit of getting you to the reception I'm not gonna hear out from anyone but I'm sure you have interesting observations so come tell me all about them uh, so here's what that data looks like so I want to orient you to this for just a second so I want to say that um, I, think there's a I think there's a statistically significant difference in the number of surface features between these two populations and unframed, but there are no statistically significant differences between biology majors and entering biology majors. And there's one study we have in the lab that shows statistically significant differences between those populations, but we have a dozen studies in the lab that shows they're not different. So we segregate them into different courses. It's not clear that we should necessarily conceptually be doing it that way. Then I want to bring your attention to these populations. So if you look at the advanced biology majors, you get, in terms of deep features, you know, maybe 55%, I forget the exact number, deep feature pairs. And then in the frame condition, you get an increase. You get up to something like, uh, I think it's like 65 or 70%. So it appears that giving the, the frame, the framing, the expert categories to the advanced biology majors, they can use it, right? So you get a decrease in surface features. Uh, increase in deep features. So that's encouraging. That says, ah, oh, you know, they're learning about that framework. They just didn't pull it out, right? But that's also really tricky because that means when they go and vote on climate change, unless somebody cues them, oh, remember energy and matter, unless we're standing right at the voting booth, like, <laughs> we're not going to get this result. So it's got some implications for, ah, oh, if they can use the framework. And to be clear, it's not like it's not like it gets to be super high. This is still not a super high percentage of deep features. But we need to somehow be training them to be able to pull that, retrieve that, I think about it as a neurobiologist, to actually use that information in the context we want them to use it. I probably encoded a boatload of physical chemistry, but I don't retrieve it for anything. No offense to the physical chemist. Like, it's in there, but it's, I don't retrieve it. Uh, and you see a similar sort of pattern with the biology graduate student. So the last thing I want to leave you with is, have you taken a look at the end values? So we started the talk. Tomasa, do you want to say something? Yeah. So this came up earlier today. So I started this talk by saying na nationwide, we hemorrhage off about 60% of biology majors out of our discipline. That's true at my institution. It's true at my institution that it's worse for students of color and first generation college going students. Uh, so one question you have to ask yourself is, well, you know, we can be all self-congratulatory about this going up. But is this learning or is this selection? So this is a study that's called a cross-sectional study, and you should be on the lookout for these. Cross-sectional study means these are not the same people. Well, you can never do it here, but these are not the same people. Um, and so it's very possible that they're learning. That's one hypothesis. We're doing a great job. We're teaching them. They're reorganizing the way they connect ideas. An alternative hypothesis is if you start off thinking like a biologist, you stay. And if you don't think like a biologist, you leave. And I forget, it came up in like three different ways over the course of this day together today. And I've really enjoyed my time here because I feel like I'm amongst dear uh, colleagues and friends. It's unclear if this is learning or if this is selection or filtering. And so we're starting to get at that. We have in the samples what we call opportunistic longitudinals. So people who happen to take it here and then we keep collecting every semester 
in our genetics class, this uh, advanced biology majors, and we're starting to have about 30 of those people that we can look at, so we might be able to have enough observations to make a comparison. But I think that this is a real, uh, a real question uh, that's only solved with a longitudinal study, which is very, very hard with a six-year graduation rate <laughs> with a lot of people leaving your discipline. So we're working on it. We can talk about the repeat effects, but yes, the same task longitudinally. I have plenty of evidence that seeing the question does not mean you can understand the answer. Yeah, but we can talk about that. Uh, so I want to leave you with saying it's a fabulous time to be in what I would call discipline-based education research. I'm a neuroscientist, and 40 years ago, I couldn't have gotten a PhD in neuroscience. I certainly wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been a journal of neuroscience. You know, something like 30,000 people gather to go to the neuroscience conference every year. So I'm very excited about what my field is going to look like uh, many years from now, 40 years from now. And if you want to read more, your uh, National Research Council published a whole report on discipline-based education research, which highlights a lot of things that many of your faculty here study, work on, care about. I'm sure there are some of your faculty that are cited in this. And I want to just thank all the students and faculty who participated. Julia Smith, who was a major driver. Uh, on this project. Paul Magami, Elijah Combs, CEPL staff, the entire CEPL admin community, and the NSF is just the most fabulous organization in the universe. None of this would happen without uh, your tax dollars at the National Science Foundation. So thank you so much for sharing your time with me, and I'm happy to answer questions after reception. Thank you.